This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 812, recorded on October 1st, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Uh, I'm looking out my window, and again, I've mentioned this before. It's a uh, Georgia O'Keeffe-like sky outside. It's fall temperatures. It's in the low 70s. Uh, the humidity is very, very reasonable. There's a light, light wind, and um, yeah, we're going to start looking forward to the leaves turning soon, and it's it's autumn. I can't believe it's October. Me neither. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 82 degrees <clears throat> and uh, partly cloudy. Had some rain recently, which is good. There's a little right. more in the forecast. It's all good. Nice weather. I don't know. I got blanket, sound blankets on the windows. I have no <laughs> idea. Actually, it looks sunny. I can see a crack up there, but I don't see the Hudson River anymore from the incubator. No. It's one of the trade-offs, sadly. Too bad. Maybe I need to put a picture of the, what it looked like yeah. at my office. Put it in back of you. Put the picture in back of you. We could do it would that. Be perfect. Yeah, we could do that. Like they also, do in the newscasts. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And uh, it's, I, I don't think it's a Georgia O'Keeffe sky. I didn't see any any uh, cow skulls or irises up there. But uh, no, 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 puffy uh, clouds. Our, our she has a... was that puffy puffy clouds. That's right. She did do that. <laughs> uh, but it's sixty seven Fahrenheit, nineteen Celsius, um, clear, sunny, very nice, lovely. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's definitely fall here. It's uh, 64, but nice and sunny. Uh, it's a pretty good day out there. 64, I, I misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's different here than it is where you are. <laughs> but, no, it, it was chilly last night. and yeah, um, yeah, that's true. It's pretty nice out there now. So this is the first week of recording at the incubator. Every, I started on Monday with Twin Tuesday Twiv. Uh, yesterday we did Twim and Daniel's report update, and now Twiv. So it's the first complete week. It's cool. But you're still the only one at the incubator. You're still you're still a clonal isolate. I'm here, and um, it's quiet. At least I yeah. don't hear my neighbors. It's a little street noise, but I can deal with that. Um, hopefully, there'll be people here at some point. Um, I've had a few people email and say, I'd like to help you uh, with your video, blah, blah, blah. So uh, maybe there'll be someone here at some point. Then I'll yell at them to be quiet, you know, so you can't win. <laughs> <laughs> but this week I also started my um, live stream virology course uh, on Wednesday. That was fun. It, we had 450 people. Um, and I showed slides, I talked, I answered their questions. We went for two hours. So that's doing that wow. one day and Wednesday. I'm going to go through my virology course from Columbia, basically. But people say they like that there are all these people and they can talk. I said, if you were in my class at Columbia, you couldn't talk to each other during class. <laughs> right? But in a, in a live stream, you can. <clears throat> They're all chatting with each other. They're like, one guy goes, what does enteric mean? And, and someone explains it to them. Right? So it's kind of cool. I like that's it. That's actually... That, that could be productive, yeah. That's neat. So you do it twice a week, sort of just like you would do your class? Yeah, I decided twice a week was good. It's Monday, Wednesday, 11 a.m. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm going to give, I give them quizzes during the uh, lectures like I do. Uh, I give them a quiz every week online. I'm going to give them a midterm and a final. I said, you don't have to take any of this, but if you want to see how you're doing. You know, and you know what? The, many of them have already watched all the videos, but they're just, they like the live stream format, right? Sure. Somebody there. So it's an experiment I think could work. And, and if it does, Brianne, I might teach a pandemic virology course. <laughs> well, that's, that sounds good. I will have uh, a whole bunch of readings and things already <laughs> worked yeah. out. Well, maybe you should come here and do it with me. I think that would be fun. It'd be fun. So, yeah, I think this is going to be fun for the next years um, to, to do and see what we can do here besides podcasting and so forth. I, I'm going to have a little interview area built. And when people visit, you know, Penn Station is two blocks away. 
they can come and we can sit down and chat, right? So yeah. could be fun. All right, today, let's get to science now. We have uh, two papers for you. The first is actually a commentary. We, we've done a couple of commentaries lately. I think they're useful. And one, the last one, I think, was uh, all about boosters, whether they're needed or not. And this one published in Cell, Emergency Drug Use in a Pandemic, Harsh Lessons from COVID-19 by Gail Cross, Jessica Ho, William Zacharias, Anand Yeyes Sekaran, and Ivan Marazzi from University of Singapore, Mount Sinai here in New York City, uh, University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. This kind of reminds me, do you remember the episode last year where we had two physicians? It was called All the Wrong COVID Moves. Yes, that was really useful. <laughs> yes. It's kind of a, this is kind of a written version of that. Yeah. Like, so their idea here, they say, is to contextualize the shared experience of scientific and clinical communities during the pandemic and examine some missteps and the lessons we have learned. Yeah, they're always missteps, right? But uh, they're pretty harsh here. And I'd like to go through and chat about them. And as always, it's fun to hear everyone's perspective as well. And they start, um, the section starts, that they start with is called pattern recognition is a cornerstone of clinical care, even for a new disease. So the idea is you should really figure out the pattern early <laughs> so you can treat it properly. And they say, you know, in China and early outbreaks in China and Italy pretty much defined the syndrome. And they told us something, it was something similar to other severe respiratory infections like SARS and MERS that we'd already dealt with. And, and they say, yet, yeah, despite that, much, much of the research in the first months was trying to differentiate it from other <laughs> respiratory illnesses through nuanced approaches, they say. What are the nuances? Well, how is, how is this different? And they say that sort of ignored the fact that it's an inflammatory disease. People were trying to figure out, oh, is a virus reproducing in kidney and endothelial cells and the gut and so forth? And they're saying, this effort overshadowed the fact that COVID was, is in fact, severe COVID, of course, not just the, not the early phase, is acute respiratory distress, ARDS, which I'm sure Ralph Barrick mentioned way back in February. Yeah. A couple times. Yeah. First time. Uh, and, you know, he said, he said, eventually we figured out that we had to give people oxygen, right? That's the way to treat ARDS. Um, and that improved mortality. And I remember Daniel talking about turning people on their belly, right? Proning. Yes, proning. For a while. Um, and, he's, and they also say it was very clear that people were dying of immune dysfunction. So, do they, so did they in SARS-1, so do they in MERS coronaviruses. And we didn't really take this up. They write a clear and coordinated clinical focus on immune dysfunction could have helped design better trials with greater emphasis on immunomodulatory strategies. And they say the WHO is just now restarting trials of uh, immunomodulatory drugs. I mean, one of the thing, one of the reasons I like this is this is really a clinical perspective. Although we'll get yes. to some basic science later, and I, I, I don't, you know, we're we're not clinicians here, but I appreciate um, how they analyze this. Well, and this perspective they bring up initially is um, that the the clinicians should have known better earlier <laughs> who were who were engaging in these these mm -hmm. sort of digressions into well maybe it's different this way maybe it's different this way but i think what might have driven some of that is that early on like march 2020 there were suddenly a lot of fully unoccupied basic researchers who were now very interested in this mm -hmm. new virus <laughs> and, and so a lot of the questions being asked by that group Kind of appropriately, because as basic researchers, you come at it from a different angle. You say, okay, well, let's get down to the details. Let's figure out what's different about this. But their point that they're making here is in the clinic, in the actual emergency, the focus needs to stay on how do we save these lives? And what you knew at that point was this is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And there's, there's medicine 
you know, there's there's a medical system for dealing with that. It's not perfectly effective, but that was that was the approach they should have stuck with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, their conclusion is key lesson pattern recognition based on what we already know is key. Even with a pandemic, you have to base it on what we know. Yeah. The next section is called principles of evidence based clinical care must not be abandoned in the midst of a pandemic. This is what Daniel says all the time, right? Evidence-based medicine. Uh, And they say, so antivirals, immunomodulatory drugs were used early on, but they said most of it was done off-label. And they cite hydroxychloroquine as an example, which did more more harm than good. And then more recently, of course, ivermectin. ivermectin. (laughs) And here, listen, folks, all you folks out there, despite high-quality meta-analyses showing little or no effect, it's continued to be used uh, off label. And, and they, they make a really good point here, which is when you do this, it makes it really hard to then do clinical trials. Yes. Right. Because it's being used so much that uh, in ways that you can't test it, right. It's not properly controlled and so forth. Yeah. Uh, they also say that many clinicians resorted to therapies without strong clinical evidence and Daniel was always harping on that, right? Sure. Don't harm your patients. And they say, herein lies a key lesson from the pandemic, the need to default to core principles of evidence-based medicine. Uh, Ad hoc use of of medicines puts a lot of people at risk. uh, And of course, um, makes it hard to design a a trial, as I've said. Those are good points that I, I wouldn't have thought of, actually. So I appreciate that. I really like the fact that all of this is also kind of getting at the reasons behind some of the confusion um, that we see sort of among members of the public about what is and is not going on because we sort of haven't always necessarily had the proper process um, happening and people are sort of confused about the process and hearing different things. And so I think both of these points about how we need to go with this pattern recognition process of what we already know, as well as, you know, how we use evidence to make uh, clinical decisions and how we kind of communicate that to the patient um, is really important because so many of the things that they're talking about here are the exact things that now are sort of conspiracy theory uh, or argument uh, that people are having that, you know, don't necessarily have a whole lot of evidence behind them. The next section is all about um, therapeutic approaches. So they first, they talk about antivirals. They say, you know, we looked at so many drugs, but most of them have turned out not to work. The, you know, they say only remdesivir has some clinical benefit, but we, we still don't know if it reduces death at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the reasons they cite for this is that in, in the panic that ensued, uh, you know, we need emergency drugs. People didn't look carefully enough at preclinical data. They said, you know, there are lots of drug screens and lots of inhibitors. But for most of them, we didn't know the mechanism of action. And that's not really useful. Um, and they also say, most of these drugs were done using a single cell line, Vero cells, <laughs> which yeah. we have really trashed a number of times here on TWIV. I mean, at, vervet kidney cells, because the virus grows in them, right? So that's why people did it. And they say here that uh, such cell lines have altered immune responses. They don't fully recapitulate growth in vivo. In fact, they don't have surface Tempress do, right? <laughs> so um it's a classic looking under the light for the keys. That's right. Thing. That's right. I mean, it grows easily in these cells. We can assay whether the cells are dead. We can do this all with a robot. Let's right. screen for drugs that work in yeah. Vero cells. If you're a Vero cell, we can hook you up, you know. <laughs> um True. but it's that doesn't tell you anything about the clinic. Uh, So they say, you know, next time we need to figure out mechanisms of action. It makes it much easier to do preclinical work. And we didn't consider viral dynamics, right? Um, uh, What what are the dynamics of virus production? How would you relate that to to treatment? And they, they make this statement that, you know, you can take an animal 
and you could infect an experimental animal and then a day later, give them a drug to test it. And they said, that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> You're never going to do that in the real world, right? <laughs> um, they, they say they sh drugs that have efficacy in animals would only be useful if when the animal is symptomatic, you give it to them and it helps. Um, and so this idea, they say, of giving drugs prophylactically for COVID is, is implausible because such a fuzzy incubation period and, and pre-symptomatic period and so forth, there's just no way that you're going to be able to use them. Their conclusion from the antivirals, they sh we should only evaluate antivirals that have shown efficacy against similar pathogens like we did with remdesivir. They say testing molecules discovered newly discovered in the pandemic without considering the natural history of the disease, the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, viral replication is destined to fail or unlikely. And they, to they bring up a really important point. I, I'm not sure it, um, if it was here or later on, um, but it, it really is critical um, that there's, and in keeping with the theme of the show that we've got going on in the background, there's a bandwidth issue here. <laughs> um, so yes. doing these clinical trials, you know, there are only so many you can do at once. And the patients who are enrolled in one are not going to be usable for another until they're yeah. done with one. And so this, this notion of, oh, let's test all the antivirals. Well, the problem is that there's an opportunity cost when you do that. And if you've got all these crummy ideas in the pipeline that tested out on Vero cells, and now you're throwing them into patients, those are patients that you can't test remdesivir on or yeah. can't test, you know, Merck's new um, antiviral on. And, and so this notion that we need mechanistic insight before we proceed is really a good winnowing process. And it's something that normally in the development process would have happened, but got short circuited in the pandemic because of this notion that, well, it's an emergency, let's try everything. Yeah. Um, but then the, the first thing you try is going to prevent the better ideas that were coming along later. Uh, it also seems to me that one of, there's a, Good news, bad news situation with drugs that uh, have been uh, pre approved, with repurposing drugs that have been pre approved for use for other conditions. Yes. Okay. And I, it, it might be interesting to review the two most prominent cases uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, where we had a drug that had already been FDA approved for some other purpose. And the idea was to repurpose it for uh, right. COVID. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the evidence that it might be worthwhile in humans was really slim. It was okay? always it had, was always anecdote or borderline anecdote, uh, and it had to do with maybe a couple of cell culture experiments uh, and uh, some rationalization about the known mechanism for these other situations that made sense in terms of COVID, and then bam all of a sudden we're doing human clinical trials. And this addresses their point here in that it basically skips a whole lot of preclinical pre studies. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, even if you have something that's already approved, many of the preclinical studies are, are going to still be relevant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing, the other thing they suggest here uh, that I thought was really interesting is to have a, basically a, 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 an approved template for how a clinical trial needs to be structured because there are clinical trials and there are clinical trials. Okay. And time and again, I've seen Daniel say, uh, you know, talk about eight, uh, several trials and, uh, basically say, well, they, they're good enough because they're, they're missing this or they're missing that, or they aren't structured. Right. And then along comes a really good clinical trial. So if everybody knows that in order to, in the end, uh, give you a valid result, a clinical trial has to have this structure, it could uh, uh, save a lot of time and energy. Well, and beyond just structure, they mentioned, um, I, I think the idea is that you would, you would design trials, take them through an IRB process and get them to the point where, okay, this could be approved as a trial to do during a pandemic, not the current one, maybe the next one. Um, and then just have that sitting on the shelf. Yes, exactly. A template. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They also say that uh, 
the immunomodulatory approaches, you know, early on they started, all right, we, we saw this was a inflammatory disease. They started giving specific inhibitors, right? Yes. Anti-IL, IL-1, anti-IL-6. And then what turned out to really work were broad spectrum ones like dex, dexamethasone, or the uh, baricitinib, the anti-Janus kinase inhibitor. So they said, you know, we should have been able to back off and say a lot of pathways are activated, inflammatory pathways, but I don't think we should go after a certain one, right? Yeah. Um, and also recognize that if you give these inhibitors too early, it's not good because you have to wait till the viral reproduction is under control. Uh, and then uh, then later on, and Daniel always says this, you can't give the, the DEX too early, otherwise you interfere with, with virus clearance. So that's um, that's really useful. So their conclusion is the hardest lesson we learned is that our arsenal of usable antivirals and immunomodulatory drugs is relatively empty and poorly equipped to deal with emerging pathogens. We have to rethink how these drugs are prioritized, designed, and identified. My wife asked me this morning, why do we only have some pills just coming out, like molnupiravir? And I said, because we put, what, 20, 30 billion into vaccines and very little into drugs. Yeah. We need to do better. Well, this is an old theme of yours, Vincent, is that there ought to be an ongoing effort to research these drugs so that you know, it's kind of the, the CEPI approach CEPI, in a way yeah, yeah, is, yeah. To, uh, is to have a, a government funded effort to uh, bring uh, several classes of drugs that might have promise up to a point where you could do really robust clinical trials on a specific pathogen and have those ready to go. Yeah. Okay, but it requires a lot of uh, uh, legwork in the background. And those are trials that you, you would go through that templating process with. Yes. Right. But, and you'd still need to do some preclinical work to actually yes. show efficacy against the specific microbe. Yes. Right. So then they, they say, okay, what have we learned? What should we do? What are the, some strategies? And they say one issue is that you're not, you know, in this pandemic, people tried to figure out what animal model was good early on, right? They weren't sure. A lot of them didn't develop serious disease. It took months and months and months. Meanwhile, you should be starting trials. Uh, and they said there wasn't enough communication between clinicians and scientists on this end, right? I can see that that would be the case. You know, Ralph Barrick's in his lab making mouse models, but they need to be talking with clinicians. Maybe he was, but uh, according to them, they need to do it more and more. Because getting that animal model out it may be limiting you. Maybe you have to go without it. Um, and they also say that, um, you know, in this pandemic, that what drugs were evaluated was largely driven by clinical opinion, but not necessarily with preclinical rationale. So preclinical is all the work that gets done before it goes into people. And they say that's really important to do that, and and we need to have a framework. As as Rich said, we need a framework for for doing uh, trials, but preclinical data are really important. And so they give a list of the ways you should uh, put together clinical trials in the future. They really say we need more close collaboration between clinicians and scientists. Clinical investigators must obtain input from virologists, immunologists, and pharmacologists to choose agents that will work during key viral time points. I think that's a, always a good point, right? Yeah. Yes, very much so. They also say we need adaptive trial designs, right? Which we have somewhat seen where you finish phase one and boom, you go right into phase two and boom, you go into phase three or, um, you know, that, that sort of, that sort of being flexible with the yes. design, right? Because they said we did a lot of phase three trials during this pandemic that never worked. They weren't likely to work to begin with. They were a waste of money. And we shouldn't really be doing that. Well, a waste of money and a waste of patience. Yes. Because again, there's the opportunity cost. What could you have been testing instead? They, all right. So then they get to the investment in research and development. As Rich said, CEPI is a good model for how you should be working on 
anti actually Seppi does vaccines and uh, ready the other nonprofit whose principals we interviewed they do uh, antivirals nonprofits they're doing the work where, where no one else wants to do it and bring it to a point where there's enough preclinical data to do a phase one they say here that we we only have drugs for nine or ten viruses out of the over 200 that cause human disease and we need actually a global effort right for all of this. This, cannot and this is be. going to this is going to have to come from the nonprofit and government funded world. Yes, because for private industry developing an antiviral, um, especially developing an antiviral against a virus you haven't found yet, I mean, there's no yeah. way yeah. There, yeah. You, you you cannot take that to the boardroom and say, "Hey, here's what we're going to work on." No, you're fired. Yes. I was so glad that they have this information here. I am certain that I will be citing this paper a lot yes. um, when talking to students because I always have a vague idea about that number, but now I have a specific number that I can quote. <laughs> the last the last part is they say, you know, this has to be a cooperative effort. It can't just be, it has to go across states, uh, countries, international. You know, we have to have global cooperation because you end up doing a trial in one country, and then you can't use the drug elsewhere. It needs to be done in multiple places at one time. But the bigger problem that they point out, which we all know about, you have one country making a vaccine and they're not sharing it because they haven't worked with anyone else. If they worked with other countries, then it would more likely be shared. And of course, that needs to be done. Cooperativity, global cooperativity. You know, I just, I agree. I think it's so important, but I just don't know if it's going to happen, right? I think there are a little... They're a little over optimistic here. I mean, yeah, it's fine yeah. because they're concluding an article where they talked about a bunch of really bad stuff and it's kind of a downer. And then they get to the point where, you know, instead of these nation specific drug approvals, we should have a global system. And they point out that we've got uh, global global regimes for dealing with things like the threat of nuclear arms and climate change. And so why can't we have global drug approval? But drug approval is a in a very different category from something that is a collective threat like nuclear arms or climate change. Um, here you're talking about approving drugs that are going to be put into individuals by physicians and it's just the whole regulatory regime for that has to be different. And I, I don't know that we're ever going to have um, an international process for that. Yeah. that. That's such a good point, but I also think it's important to talk about yeah. Because yes. the differences from country to country impact all of the other points. Yes. You know, for example, if we have different uh, rules in that framework in different countries, then that could result in a drug being approved in one country and not another. Yes. And that sort of leads to those. Well, why do they have it? I heard this drug works. Why you say it doesn't work? Um, it, it leads to all of that difficulty. Um, that we're dealing with right now. And so thinking about ways that we can all agree on a framework and all be on the same page um, could be particularly helpful. Yeah, I think an analogy that would actually work maybe a little better is something like aviation or uh, maritime regulations hmm. where or radio regulations where th we, we had this acknowledgement that some things cross borders like airplanes and radio waves and ships. And so we need to harmonize our regulations internationally and that's why it's possible to take a flight from Newark to Beijing, you know, and, and not have to have a different airplane that you change to at some point because it's not approved in the other country. Um, so so we could we could streamline this a lot at the international level. Yes. So I've just joined Zoom on my laptop and it seems to be much better. OK, weird. Isn't that weird? Because this is on a regular computer and it's there. Maybe there's right. something wrong, a connection. But anyway. Hi. Hi. Hello, hi. Vincent. <laughs> I'm not freezing. Um, it's indicating on your video that you're muted. Uh, can you hear but me? I can hear you. I can hear yes. you. Yes, yeah. I can hear you. That's because oh, the, 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 the audio. Computers. The the audio is, got it. The audio yeah. is still going through the other computer. Okay. I'm on two computers. So I have yes. one. Dedicated. I saw, you, so I, I saw you come up twice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm dedicated. I have one dedicated to Zoom now. So, and then I have my laptop where I'm reading the papers. Got I it. thought I always wanted to do that, but I didn't have it at uh, Columbia. But so the audio is still going through the original. I think that's fine. Right. This cheap? should make an interesting editing session for you, Vince. Yes. So anyway, that's fun. Uh, it's probably open access. So check it out. I, I think uh, it's it really is open good access. Commentary. A lot of covers a lot of things I didn't know. All right, now we have, we're moving away from COVID now. Notice folks, I'm trying to wean you off 
COVID, by having a non-COVID paper each episode. And last time, what did we talk about? That was, I forgot the paper. Giant viruses. Giant viruses. <laughs> that was really fun. Today, we're going to talk about improving viral vectors. We're going to talk about a small virus. A small virus. Yeah. This paper. We've gone from the biggest to the smallest. It's amazing. This paper is amazing. Yeah, it, this paper is yeah. amazing. It's yeah. huge. The figures are huge. And there are not that many people on it, actually. We have, so this is directed evolution of a family of AAV, adenovirus-associated virus capsid variants, enabling potent muscle-directed gene delivery access across species. Really remarkable findings, actually. And uh, I, I'm trying to work in DNA viruses, too, here, right? Not just non-COVID, but DNA. Uh, we have two co-first authors, Mohammad Sharif Taba Boardbar and Kim Lagerboard. And then two uh, corresponding authors, Amy Waggers and Pardis Sabeti. And these come from a consortium up in uh, Boston, the Broad Boston, Institute of yeah. Harvard and MIT, Harvard Medical School. Um, uh, yes, you know, various hospitals in Boston. And um, this is actually all about using viruses as vectors. So adeno-associated viruses, a small single-stranded DNA containing virus with nicosahedral capture, which is very popular for gene therapy applications because you can put pretty big genes in it. You could grow up a lot. It's easy to grow up and purify. But maybe most importantly, when you infect cells, the gene expression lasts a long time, right? It persists sometimes for years. There's a drug approved by the FDA called Luxturna, which is for a certain kind of blindness. And Last for years, at least in the dogs where it was tested preclinically, uh, their their vision re remains for years. So that's a big plus, and it doesn't integrate. It remains episomal. Right, Rich? Right. I think, in fact, uh, one of the initial motivations for studying this is that under certain conditions, mostly in cell culture, uh, uh, the, in this it can integrate. OK. Right. And I think there was a sort of a I, I may be wrong here, but I think there was a sort of an expectation early on that that might be used to get permanent expression in some cell lines. It turned out that uh, under the sorts of conditions that we use it, that doesn't happen. But fortuitously, it also turned out that the DNA um, persists uh, as an episome, that is a separate piece of DNA in the nucleus of cells that have taken it up uh, and express whatever uh, gene you've uh, stuck into it over an extremely long period of time. Yeah, yeah the, think, and these are these are adeno-associated viruses because they have a kind of a symbiosis there, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, or a parasitism. So, uh, let's anyway. let's quickly do <laughs> let's quickly do these guys. Okay, yeah. they are um, single-stranded DNA viruses. That is, the genome consists of a single strand of DNA. Mm -hmm. Man, I can't remember how long they are, but I'm going to guess about uh, between two and three kb. They're okay? small because they encode two or three genes. Actually, they they really encode just two genes: a capsid protein and a protein involved in replication. They're naked capsid viruses, so they're in a small icosahedral capsid that does not have a membrane. Uh, they're ubiquitous throughout nature. People are familiar with a number of different of these. There's a, a disease of humans called fist disease that you get as a, as a kid that shows up uh, as a rash. And it can also cause a transient uh, anemia uh, under some circumstances. Uh, there's canine parvovirus, which is a pretty nasty disease of dogs. I believe there's a vaccine for that you now and uh, a number of other different parvovirus associated diseases. This particular parvovirus, adeno associated virus, was discovered, I believe, in uh, cell cultures where people were culturing uh, adenovirus as a basically a viral contaminant. Uh, and uh, these are uh, a sort of a subset of these viruses called dependoviruses because I don't know if they're called that anymore, but they used to yes, be. Yes, they are. <laughs> um, because uh, they uh, need adenovirus as a helper in order to, in order to go through a complete replication cycle. Um, nowadays, those helper functions can be supplied 
mm-hmm. in the form of appropriate genes expressed in uh, appropriate cell lines in uh, in trans. Uh, but I suppose uh, that's another theoretical advantage of the adeno-associated virus is that it's not pathogenic in humans. Right. Okay. And it's not going to, it's not going to be amplified and grow in particular, uh, these particular, um, gene therapy vectors, uh, what they consist of is the, you start with the genome and you delete almost everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. The cap protein and the rep protein, and then put in whatever gene it is that you wanted to deliver to a cell under the control of whatever transcriptional promoter uh, that is control sequence, expression control sequence that you think is appropriate. Uh, And then using uh, cell culture tricks. I mean, those are dead viruses. They can't replicate by themselves, okay? But what they have is the important elements of the virus to get into the cell and persist as a DNA molecule. And everything else is just standard molecular biology. And you can, uh, since it's uh, uh, essentially dead, you have to grow it up using certain cell culture tricks that involves uh, providing all of the necessary replication functions, uh, in what we call in trans, that is separately. And then you purify the virus away from all that kind of stuff. And that's your gene therapy tool. The only real downside to this guy is that it doesn't have an in- infinite capacity. Okay, so you got to trim your genes or, uh, or select them or deliver them in batches because the, the uh, packaging capacity is, I don't know, Something less than three kilobases. Yeah, and, and it's also another another disadvantage for many types of gene therapy is that it's not a very specific virus, which is what this paper is getting at uh, in terms of cell type. Yeah. <clears throat> so <laughs> it it goes in and infects whatever. And if you wanted to target, I don't know, to pick a random example, muscle cells, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> random. then then that's. It may hit some of them, but yeah. it's not going to be very effective at targeting muscles. Yeah. I, I want to spend just a minute here, too, since this is the first time in a long time doing this, to talk about what we mean by gene therapy. Okay. Basically, what it means is delivering to cells uh, genes that are different from what's already there mm-hmm. uh, in hopes that you'll change that cell in a fashion that uh, is good. Uh, lots of times, uh, genetic diseases have to do with a gene in a, in a, in a, an animal, a person that's either, uh, been, com- uh, is completely missing, at least in terms of functionality or is not working correctly. And the idea would be to, uh, correct that. Now there's, uh, two ways to deliver that. And there's two ways to correct it. One way to deliver it. If you're talking about a blood disease, you can actually take out some blood. Okay. And engineer it in a test tube and then stick it back in. Okay. Which is pretty cool. That's what's called ex ex vivo. But if you're talking about a liver or a muscle, you can't necessarily do that. You have to do that in vivo. So deliver your gene therapy vector and hope that it goes to the right place or engineer it so that it does, which is the subject of this paper, uh, and have all of the engineering done in place. Uh, now, downstream from that, there's two types of therapy, as the as I see it, at, at least two types. One is to um, supply hmm. the missing or supply the correct version of the missing gene, okay, on an ongoing basis. Okay, from whatever you've supplied. Okay, so deliver an adenovirus vector that provides a proper hemoglobin or something like that when the existing hemoglobin isn't working right. Okay, I'm just making that up. Okay, so but the other uh, one that I was not totally tuned in to until this paper is given all the recent advances, you can deliver the gene editing tools with a vector. This gives me chills and edit the genes in the normal cells. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. And when gene therapy just started, I don't think anybody was thinking that. No. no. Okay. But now with CRISPR, you can do that. You can do targeted gene editing from a gene therapy vector. Holy cow. Yeah. They do it in this paper, actually. Yeah. So so there's, there's one other piece of AAV that we should at least mention. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
there are some ideas for a few different potential gene therapy vectors. Um, so those viruses that could deliver um, the genes, um, as Rich mentioned, and AAV has some pluses and some minuses. Um, but one other plus to it, or at least discussed uh, thing with it, uh, is the fact that um, it seems to interact with some aspects of the immune system somewhat differently. And so you may have some, you know, if, if you were going to use adenovirus, say, it's possible that you could be already, you could have, you could be ready to get some gene therapy and someone could say, actually, it turns out you have antibodies against the adenovirus we were going to use. So your immune system won't let us do this. Sorry. Um, and it seems like that is less of a problem um, with AAV. Um, and people have been doing a lot of work to design different capsids um, to try to get around some of that. And so thinking about the structure of different AAV capsids and all of the different ways you can tweak and design the capsids to make sort of designer capsid um, to get around immune responses, but also potentially get to different cell types, like Alan mentioned, um, has been really key. And I just want to touch on two things with gene therapy. Um, so one is um, that that was excellent point on AAVs, <laughs> pluses and minuses. Um, the um, the viral targeting approach is one general strategy, and you pick your viral vector and you target your cells with a virus. Um, the other, as Rich Im, um, implied, with the uh, the ex vivo approach, is you engineer the cells outside the body. And the latest thing with that is to actually take patient cells. Um, use stem cell technology to backdate them to become stem cells, either pluripotent stem cells that can become almost anything or just the stem cell for the tissue that you're targeting. Like mm -hmm. if the patient has some genetic skin disease and their skin is falling off, you bring the cell back to become a skin stem cell, engineer it, implant that stem cell into the patient, which is, which is science fiction of its own, you know, come it's become reality. Um, so there's that approach. Um, the, uh, there are risks and benefits of both of these types of strategies and people are trying to proceed with caution. Um, the, uh, the viral vectoring strategy has a checkered past of its own. There have been, you know, examples where people took perfectly reasonable approaches into the clinic. These are typically being done in very, very ill patients because these are people with a genetic disease that for ethical reasons, you don't want to do this on somebody who's just, you know, gee, I'd like to change my eye color. You want to do it on somebody who, gosh, they're going to die if we don't do something. So if we have a bad outcome from this gene therapy trial, well, they're, they're tossing in with what their odds were before. Um, and there have been unforeseen complications coming out where, oh, wow, we didn't realize this virus could go to the liver like that. Patients did, you know, as a result of the vector um, doing something that we didn't know the vector could do. And this paper is going to try and address that by making the targeting more specific. Yeah, well, the diseases that are addressed in this paper are muscular diseases, a number of muscular diseases with genetic bases, and we could correct them by delivering the gene or, or altering as, as Rich said, the gene that's there, but we need a vector, an AAV that will preferentially infect muscle. And the problem with the vectors, AAV vectors that are used is they tend to go to the liver when you put them intravenously. And that's great for a liver disease, but not so great for a muscle disease. So they say, we know how to modify the capsid that's been done before. We have the three dimensional structure. We know places we can put, amino acids in. So let's try and redirect these viruses to muscle and and take it away from liver, or at least reduce it and see what happens. So they actually develop a platform, which in the end you could actually use for any tissue that you're interested in, not just muscle, For with AAV vectors. You could modify in the same way. And this, this platform is called Deliver. <laughs> Directed evolution of AAV capsids leveraging in vivo expression of transgene RNA. <laughs> Soon to be a registered trademark, I expect. You think they worked <laughs> really hard to get deliver to get I, all the words? I, this is I like the names for, for clinical trials or um, you know, they're 
or sometimes legislation is done this way where they they say, oh, yeah. what cool acronym could we do? But this is actually pretty descriptive of the approach that they're taking. So the here's the overall approach, and then we'll we'll go through some of the data. You take AAV9, which is one of the original isolates that's used for, for gene therapy. And, you know, you have a DNA copy and you can modify the DNA. They put random seven amino acid peptides between two specific amino acids in a part of the capsule they know can, can take uh, inserts and it's going to be exposed on the capsid surface. Okay. And then the idea is, you know, they grow this up and they make a lot of different, I mean, imagine seven amino acids scrambled in all possible combinations. They grow up this virus and then they infect mice. They pull out muscle and they ask which, they sequence RNA and DNA from muscle. And they ask, what are the top viruses in terms of sequence reads that are apparently getting into muscle really well? and um, making RNA. And, so, so right? I, I, yeah, I want to I want to do a little more detail in as much to see if I understand it <laughs> as anything else because I struggle with this and I looked through some of the methods and I think I got this right. So what I came away with, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the way the a virus library was set up, it reminds me of phage display, okay? Where the transgene is uh, the, the capsid protein. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, that contains this site that you can tinker with. That's right. So that when the viruses that are put together, it, uh, when the viruses are put together, any individual virus particle uh, has the cap the the variant of the capsid that's encoded by the transgene that's in that virus, okay? So that when you del if that capsid uh, works, then it delivers that DNA molecule that mm -hmm. encodes that capsid, and it also transcribes into that RNA molecule. That's right. In the end, they sequence the RNA because they point out that a lot of this stuff in the past, the screening has been done by looking for DNA, and that's not good enough, okay? Because the the end result that you want is transcription. Right. And it could be that the DNA gets in, but for some other reason, maybe it doesn't uncoat right because of the capsid mutation or something like that, you don't get transcription. So what you want to look at is transcription. But there's a, there's a direct association between the capsid that's binding and the gene that's delivered. Okay, which I think is is key to making this work. Yeah. In fact, so, they show that there, when you do this experiment, you'd get DNA into muscle, but not a lot of transcript. And so they have to fix that, right? And they that's where they add muscle-specific promoters to drive transcription and then get better muscle-specific activity. Brianne, what, you were going to say something? I, I was just going to remind listeners who have not heard about and thought about these things very much that you know these are very much viruses to be used in this experiment in the lab normally when we would make this the the gene we would be delivering is not the cap the capsid right. gene it right. is normally the transgene so yes. instead of instead of having the transgene which is what we are eventually going to do in a gene therapy type of thing here we're developing the capsid because that lets us tell which capsid was yeah. the good one. Right. So you can take these, you can infect anywhere, you can infect the mice systemically and pick out any tissue you want. In fact, previously this has been done for CNS uh, production of, of AAV, right? But here they're doing it for muscle. So they take out different kinds of muscle because we have different kinds, right? We got heart muscle, we got striated muscle and so forth. They say uh, this is a, I love this. This is a big target. Because 40% of your body mass is muscle. Apparently, apparently. So they do two rounds of this. They infect mice, they pull out the sequences, they make virus, or they, uh, they make virus from the top hits, and then they go into mice for a second round. The first round, they got 5 million unique capsid variants, 5 million <laughs> from just scrambling a seven amino acid sequence. That's amazing. Uh, and then they did a second round 
And the top hits, this is just the power of selection. The top hits all have a three amino acid sequence in common. You know, they put seven in, but all of the top hits had RGD, argly asp, which is a very well-known amino acid triplet because it binds to very specific receptors on cells called integrins. So all the top hits have an RGD. And so that must be important for targeting uh, to muscle, remember, because they're selecting for really high DNA and RNA uh, in muscle. That's all they're doing. They're not selecting against anything else. They're just saying what does really well uh, in muscle. So they pick one of these, they give it a name, Myo AAV 1A, and they do some experiments with it. And they find that this does really well in muscles. They put now they put a transgene in that they can measure. Oh, and they have pictures where they can image mice. There are just hundreds of mice in these pictures. Yes. <laughs> and you can see the transgene is glowing. And so you can easily take a picture. You can look at the original vector and their better vector and so forth. And well, this is this is open access. This is open and the, access. And the pictures yes. are glorious. They've stuck they in a fluorescent, uh, green fluorescent protein uh, so that they, as a marker, so that they can have a visual readout of how these things are targeted. And it's just mind boggling. Figure, figure two is just, mm -hmm. wow. That's, it, it encompasses not only how well this thing is working, but also how much work went into this paper. Yeah. Yeah, My a, lot, gosh. a lot of work. Well, and, they, and I also love you know the GFP where they're showing you know the liver, and they're yes. showing that it doesn't have that right. dramatic yes. um, phenotype that you see in say the quadriceps. Um, and so I think that that was also really nice to see was you know that this is really targeting the muscle. Yeah, yeah, you see it where you want it, and you you emphatically don't see it where you don't want it. So they're putting in to these mice systemically. So they're putting it intravenously. Yeah. 10 to the 12th viral genomes. <laughs> That's a lot of viral genomes per mouse. So it, it turns out to be four times 10 to the 13th viral genomes per kilogram. And mice are less than a kilogram, right? So that's a lot of viral genomes. Mm. Uh, and later they're going to make one actually where you can use a lot less. Uh, and it works really well. They do a series of studies showing you get really good enhanced muscle delivery something like 10 to 25 times higher RNA in muscles. Uh, it's higher in the heart and it's 2.8 times lower in the liver. Um, they note that the improved efficiency of this vector is mostly in striated muscle. Um, it can, um, it can be, it does get into other tissues, but at, far less efficiency. You get a lot less uh, RNA produced. And it sticks around. It yeah, sticks that, around. that was also really which impressive. Is, yeah, which is another, actually in figure two, you see <laughs> yep. they go out to day 120, which is a significant chunk of a mouse lifespan. Um, and it's still there, still cooking along, yeah. still cranking out the protein. That's the beauty of these vectors. They just stick around, yeah. They look to see if these vectors damage the liver. That's an original issue with the parent vector, yeah. right? You have to give so much that it, and it mostly goes to the liver. It causes liver toxicity. I think they mentioned they had to stop a human trial because of yes. some toxicity. So they look at liver damage in mice and they don't find it. Not much different from um, the animals injected with vehicles. So no liver damage there. Uh, the antibodies against the parent virus, AAV9, Cross-react with this one, which is good um, if you ever needed to stop it for some reason. This works and they've tried different mouse strains infecting them besides the, the mouse. They selected it in a couple of other mouse strains. It works better in muscle, less better in liver in all of them. They tried intramuscular delivery, right? Because sometimes you might want to target a specific muscle. Same results, really works well uh, in the muscle. Um, and then they say, what about humans? <laughs> so they get human primary- so they lined up and they held out their arms, no. <laughs> primary myotubes from four different donors. So apparently you can give some tissue and they can make cultures of myotubes. And um, this 
improved vector infects them 23 times higher compared to the parent vector. They also uh, make, st they make muscles from stem cells. Uh, this is from mice now, and they find the same results better in uh, muscles th than the original vector. Let's see, this goes on and on. They have so many experiments. It is. I think there's one other thing that was sort of important about the, the intramuscular experiment. Mm -hmm. um, that's also a lot easier to do than some of the systemic administrations. And so if you're thinking about how you would actually, you know, deliver this to patients in terms of, you know, how you know difficult it's going to be to deliver and what kind of um setup you're going to need, what kind of um, situation. Doing an IM is much easier here mm. than doing your than doing anything else. Um, you know, you got your flu shot IM. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then they ask, can this uh, vector deliver a gene and correct a muscular disease? So they, um, here's where they use CRISPR. They're actually going to correct they have a mouse model, right, for, um, um, what is it? Uh, Shen's muscular dystrophy. Shen's muscular dystrophy, right, where the gene's got a mutation that's screwing up things, and they're going to cut it out with CRISPR. <laughs> so they deliver the Cas9 nuclease along with guide RNAs in these vectors. And the, the, the uh, RNAs are designed to uh, excise a very specific exon and restore, I think, a reading frame that's been disrupted by a stop codon. Um, and this works. Um, this, this kind of approach, I think, has been tested before, but now they're delivering it with uh, their new and improved vectors. And what is the injection here? Is it systemic? Um, I think it might be, yeah. I think most of them are systemic. I, yeah, I think most of them systemic. are systemic, yeah. yeah. And they get very good yeah. uh, targeting to muscle with this vector and not with the uh, AAV9. It doesn't work as well. Far less efficient frequencies, right? And then the, yeah, the in protein... Fact in the, in the um, figure for this, this another one of these massive full page figures, they actually had to put the legend on the next page. So in figure <laughs> three, you see pictures of the mice and the... Um, You've got the, the control mice are lying on their sides, and I don't know if they're dead, but uh, and the, the experimental mice are standing upright. So actually, that's the uh, that's the other gene. That's, that's oh, the MTM gene. That's the MTM, right? Okay. They just do with dystrophin. They just show that they can uh, they can give uh, uh, right. they can they can get the gene expressed, and they do some experiments. I think with uh, muscle or right. whatever, but yeah. they don't. Uh, I'm I'm guessing. It doesn't do too much for the mice or it's harder to assay. So they have right. another gene that they used. MTM, what's that stand for? Myotubular myopathy. Excellent yes. myotubular myopathy. This is a different mouse, different mouse model. Different, different model. Gene. In this case, they're delivering the protein or the gene yes. encoding a protein. Yeah, the right. mice are knocked out for the gene and and they're that's the model for the disease, right? right? right. And they can restore it. Yeah. They uh then they they show the protein is produced and um, yeah the, they do some muscle function assays right um, they, I mean the mice are more the mice are more active but they have some strength uh, assays that they do uh, specific force assays and these mice are all improved uh, compared to the parental yeah I don't know why it took me until now to think of this or to mm -hmm. realize this but I'm realizing right now. In theory, you could also use this to do something like a tissue specific deletion of a gene. And so if your yes. if your gene of interest has a um, is you know, has different functions in different cell types, you could just remove it in the pathologic cell type. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, you could. So do you um so is it based on the vector or the target? Are you saying so the target is well, the gene's going to be everywhere? So you're going to right, have but, specifically but get so the vector you, in. Right? You could use so based on this, if say you wanted to remove a gene in muscle that's causing a problem in muscle, but leave it untouched in other cell types. Yeah, yeah. You I could mean, use this vector. Target. Yeah, 
Yeah. But this is not 100%. It still gets no. in. Right, right. So maybe no. you can inject it into muscle and get most of it in the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to get better. I'm not going to live long enough, but it's going to get better. <laughs> uh, the, the part of this figure that I really love the best uh, that we've we've had similar experiments in the past is part I, where they these are the MTM mice, and this really does a number on these mice. Are they yeah, uh, the, this is the difference between life and death. Yes, and in this particular assay, they've got uh, all these mice are in cages with uh, wheels, mm -hmm. okay, and the wheels are hooked up to a monitor, okay, and right. so <laughs> they monitor how much these mice run on their wheels. Okay. And the wild type mice and the gene uh, edited for mice. Uh, gene corrected mice are just fine. They're running their, yeah. running their little heinies off. Okay. <laughs> and the others are not doing so hot. Oh. Yeah. You, you hook up a sensor to these wheels and they can monitor them 24 seven. Yeah. And make tons of data. It's amazing. Right. Which you couldn't do years ago. Actually, I just noticed that the Y axis on that is, <laughs> is weeks. Yeah, And so the mice are uh, born and it goes up and their peak of activity is between uh, like uh, eight and 13 weeks. And then as they get older and older, they get less active. Yes. They turn into couch potatoes. Dude. And that's the wild type as well as the treated. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When, uh, when we work with mice, the young ones are always the feistiest, right? Mm -hmm. They get older, they're kind of, this is lab mice now, but they're easier to catch when they're older. <laughs> It's true for other animals too. Like, and when yes. you pick them up, <laughs> the, the the young mice want to bite you right away. They turn and they're very flexible. They turn the head true. around immediately. But the adults kind of just hang there. You know, <laughs> they don't really try to bite. I noticed that. Yeah. Um, and then they do a whole series of studies to try and understand what's allowing these improved vectors to target. Obviously, it involves this RGD that they have inserted there and, and selected for. Um, but um, this is a, like a whole separate paper, really. They're looking yes. at how this thing binds and, and what's the specificity. Because there are a lot of integrins, right? Um, a whole different set of in cell surface molecules that will bind uh, proteins that have this RGD motif. And by the way, the RGD motif was first recognized in 1984 as part of fibronectin that allows fibronectin to bind the receptor, which was the, which is the integrin called alpha five beta one. It's a, it's a heterodimeric plasma membrane protein. And I remember these papers. I used to read them all the time and they're out of Finland and have names that I could never pronounce, but really well-known cell biologists. So that's when it was discovered. And since then, we know that RGD allows binding to a whole bunch of different integrins. They got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different integrins. I want to, I want to do integrins here for a minute. <laughs> tell me if I, tell me if I screw this up. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my understanding is that uh, most cell types are uh, bristling with integrins. Okay. These are transmembrane proteins that have some sort of a uh, binding domain on the exterior surface of the cell that binds something and uh, typically a signaling domain on the interior. And uh, the things that they bind to, first of all, uh, cells in a tissue are not necessarily, uh, well, uh, cells in a tissue make an extracellular matrix, fibrous protein and stuff that's, that basically forms a, a mesh, a network but, uh, between the cells. Uh, and the integrins bind these things and keep the cells in place, or the cells can uh, crawl on them. The integrins also, cells can bind to each other, all right? And when they bind things, they send off signals, okay? Mm -hmm. So the cells can sense their environment. They know where they are, okay, based on what their integrins are binding to. So they're like, um, you know, whiskers. Uh, yes. Well, prehensile whiskers, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because the cell the cell can also sort of open and close the integrate in the integrin in order to bind to something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really important and fascinating molecules. Indeed. And, and a bunch of them turn out to be receptors for viruses, as you might expect, right? They're on the cell surface. They're quite numerous. Um, a bunch of Enteroviruses bind integrins, uh, adenovirus famously, the, 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 the internalization receptor is an integrin. And in fact, 
So the adenovirus is bind first one receptor and then a second in, is an integrin and that signals into the cell to start endocytosis <laughs> and keep polymerizing the actin microfilm is it's just great. And I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that there are differences in the extracellular matrix between one tissue and another. Yes. Yeah. That a liver extracellular matrix is going to look different than a mus uh, muscle extracellular sure. matrix. Sure. Therefore, the integrins are going to be different. So it makes perfect sense that there might be tissue specificity and the expression of the integrins that one might take advantage that the virus fortuitously or, you know, anthropomorphically could take advantage of yeah. for uh, doing tissue specific delivery. This is marvelous. Yeah. yeah. So I often think of, of the integrins as part of the address label um, that labels different cell types uh, to tell uh, white blood cells, which ones they should go hang out in. Okay. Right. It's like in some neighborhoods, they pronounce it integrin and in others, they call it integrin. <laughs> We've been using both, I think. Here. I know, yeah. yes. <laughs> I just wanted to point out, because I always think of them as integrins and Vincent's yeah, I integrins. Too. And I, I thought, oh, are I'm we going to have differences on pronunciation? And then Rich actually switched between the two. And I think Brianne was doing integrins. So. I'm probably wrong. Yeah, I, do integrins. I always pronounce things. But. <laughs> no, I've, I've heard it both ways in talks by cell biologists who, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's one of those words that it's made up, right? It's so made up, of course. All words it. are, but this one in particular. Yes, all words are. Just some have been made up for longer More than recently. others. Yes. <laughs> um, they do a variety of experiments. For example, they overproduce each integrin on a cell and ask, does the vector get in? And basically, all of them allow better entry of the vector, but only some of them improve the affinity of binding, right? So they're two things going on. The virus is binding to the integrin and then it's getting in. So they all can mediate entry, but some are better at binding uh, than others. They have some drugs that are integrin antagonists, two different drugs, and they both uh, block AAV entry. I mean, this is showing that the uh, integrin binding is what is really important for the entry of these vectors. Um, they ha They make soluble integrin protein. They produce it in cells, they, uh, they purify it, and they ask, uh, what does this do to vector? Um, and in fact, um, so alpha V beta six, the more the protein you add, it inhibits transduction by these vectors. But none of the other recombinant integrins did that, even though they apparently the vector can bind to them and get in. But if you make the soluble receptors, only one will block uh, attachment. Now you may think, why is that important? And only someone who likes receptors would really appreciate that. But you know, there's subtleties here. There's not just binding, right? There's other things going on. And uh, you'll see in a bit that that uh, plays a role. And this, this integrin binding entry <clears throat> as, as an entry receptor, this is a newly acquired skill right for this vector it, yes there's a, that's right there's a there's an aav receptor that's been identified separately right. that the virus normally uses to get into cells and here by yeah. selecting for ones that get into muscle they've selected for the ability to use integrins as a receptor yes that's really cool you can give it a new specificity yep yeah so they conclude that alpha v beta 6 is has the highest affinity and it must be on muscles by definition because uh, that's uh, possibly how it's targeted to muscle. Now, let's see. I don't want to, let's not talk about the sugars. That's not so so interesting. But AAV receptor is a separate protein, as Alan has, has mentioned. It's called the AAV receptor, AAVR. It's a, it's a plasma membrane protein. And apparently most serotypes of AAV, except for a couple, will, will bind it. And they want to know. So now that we've given the virus the ability to bind integrins, does it still need to bind? It still bind the old one. Yeah, the old one. The answer is yes, because in in uh, if you knock out AAV, you know there you 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 don't get entry. But if you put in uh, the integrin receptor, you don't you still you get entry, but not as good as with AAVR. So they say the two receptor pathways are playing distinct roles and probably utilized at different stages. So one could be a binding molecule, the other could meet, lead to endocytosis or both, or who knows, right? So, so it's as if the uh, 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 integrin is, or, or integrin is uh, serving kind of as a co-receptor. It could right? be. 
It could be. Yeah. Um, though you may have a very specific definition of co-receptor, mm -hmm. but it's not. That's not a normal AAV thing, as far as I know. Right, as no, you said. Typically, it would just bind to AVR and get in. Yeah. Um, by uh, the way, there's a there's a we may I don't know if we'll get to it, but there's a uh, a commentary on this paper. I think in the same right. issue that that's Vincent, a pretty good commentary. Uh, yes. Uh, and there's a a picture of the there's a sort of a summary picture a figure, uh, and it shows the capsid and colored and stuff, and you can see on the surface of the capsid uh, where the threefold protrusion is that they're doing this engineering. And so that gives you kind of a, a visual thing about there's this bump on the capsid yeah. uh, that's being engineered that, that uh, inter interacts with the uh, integrin. Yes. It's a nice picture. Yeah. All right. Now, if this wasn't enough, they said, can we do better? Can we get a vector where we don't need to put in 10 to the 12th genomes? per mouse, right? So they say, okay, we have RGD and that's really good, but what about the amino acids around it? Maybe if we mess with them, we could make it even better or efficient. So they randomize position, amino acid positions around the RGD and make this whole, do this whole, um, what's the name of the, the approach again? Uh, Deliver. 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 Thank Deliver. you. And they do it again. They do two rounds in mice. Uh, and they end up with top hits, uh, which are even better. And they have amino acid changes in the sequence surrounding the uh, RGD. Um, they do all the same experiments we have talked about, uh, more efficiently doing muscle than liver. Um, and they can use less, less numbers of vector genomes than um, the original one. It's, this still binds an integrin but uh, it appears to enable higher affinity binding. And, and now it's my, more affinity to more integrins than the original one. The other original was alpha V beta six, I think. And this one is higher affinity to others, which may help it get more efficiently into muscle cells. So that's pretty cool that they did that, right? Yeah, and yeah. look at those mice and how much uh, transgene they're getting by day 21. Yeah. That's amazing. Then they, they do another... Uh, therapeutic experiment, um, another, um, there, there are some human trials for DMD, muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, using adenovirus vectors, but these are the parental vectors, not the modified ones. Um, and they mentioned that some of those have shown some improvement, but they use a, high, a lot of virus and they get some uh, toxicity. So they wanted to know in their mouse model uh, of a DMD, would this improved uh, vector work? And they um, they show it does work really better than the uh, than the first round of vector, and they can use uh, less virus. In fact, and you know my, the dystrophin protein is made. It's in it's in a variety of pro of uh, muscles, um, and they can use less vector to achieve the same effect. So that's good. And they also do some muscle uh, assessments, specific force measurements. Here, push against this pad. <laughs> mm. I don't know how it works, but there you go. Now, now, if that wasn't enough, then they say, what about non-human primates? So they do the, the selection in cinemologous macaques. Same, same idea. They start with AV9. And I just want to reiterate the amount of work <laughs> Huge. in this. My, yeah. I, I, wow. I wonder how long this has been going on. I, it's been going on at least a couple of years because I know oh. a paper was published in 2020, which did this a similar thing using a different approach. And they mentioned in the discussion, while this yes. work was in progress, that was published and that was 2020. right. right. So they end up getting the same RGD hits you know, that the highest efficiency, they take out the tissue from uh, the cinemologous macaques and they pick the highest viruses and they have RGD again. And when they repeat it, they get surrounding, they can do the surrounding motif, the surrounding amino acid experiment. And they get the same amino acid selected, which is kind of nice because the non-human primates are, are close to humans, right? And, 
we don't know if what's going to work in a mouse will work in, in humans. So it's kind and of you, nice. You obviously can't do this the same way in humans no, where you, cannot. you know, do the selection and then, then take the tissue you're interested in. Yeah, you really can't. You have to deliver a therapeutic gene. You have to, you have to yeah. already be done with the selective yeah. process yeah. when you get to the human. No. So you, you, you presumably do the selection in mice or in something else, but. Yeah, and, and we're non-human primates here. And, yeah. and um, so then um, they take these viruses and give them both to uh, cacks uh, and mice. And um, they show they transduce muscles better than liver uh, in both. Uh, amazing. That's That's it. Yeah. So in, that, oh, that's all. <laughs> that's, that, that's it. Yeah. So uh, similar results in in non-human primates. Although they say in the discussion, and I want to pull this part up that I highlighted here. So um, um, there's a difference in in the mouse variants are not as good in non-human primates as the non-human primate variants. They work, but they're not as good. But the non-human primate variants work really well in both non-human primates and mice. And they say that's important for preclinical evaluation because now you know the mouse is comparable to the non-human primate if you use the NHP selected uh, vectors. And so, right. it, you know, in your preclinical work where you're doing it in two, and, and you could do it in mice, for example, you don't have to use non-human primates, which would limit the number of animals that you could do, right? Right, so you, you could do, let's say you wanted to target, I don't know, um, some other tissue, um, but let's say you wanted to target heart, but the cardiac muscle preferentially. Um, and so you do this experiment again, you would do your initial evolution in the non-human primate, get your mm -hmm. virus, figure out, oh, okay, this is the virus we need, but then you could do your actual trial, uh, your preclinical testing of, can we get the therapy in? Is it effective? You could do all yes. that in mice. Right. You could do it in mice because you can and use one, hundreds of mice, right? And you can't right. use hundreds. Of you them. can't use hundreds of, no. I wonder if there's uh, not some sort of um, organ culture system or maybe yes. cadaverous tissue or something that you could use to do the selection on human tissue. It occurred to me that um, you could do this with either stem cell derived tissues or organoids or. Um, well, about those myotubes they made, but maybe they're in small demand. Maybe you can't get enough of those to do it at the quantity they need, right? I mean, based on based on what we've discussed so far, I would kind of, if, if at all possible, I'd want to do some, this in something that is like a tissue. Yeah. Because of the role of the uh, integrants. I, yeah. I okay. think or, organoids are the way to go. Human, human Maybe. derived organoids. Actually, that would be a good experiment, a proof of concept to do, to do the selection in an organ, muscle yes. organoid and see if you get the same things, right? Yeah, that would be key. Um, yeah. So here we have, we they've made uh, AV derived vectors, which have better targeting to muscle there. You can use less. There's no liver toxicity. And so it's a, they say it's a proof of concept. You could use this for any tissue. You just pull the viruses out of whatever tissue you want and you could do similar things. Now they mentioned one thing here that I think is really interesting. They say the, these integrins that bind RGD, they're not specific to muscle. You can find them in other tissues. So why is this preferentially these vectors transducing muscle? They say, we don't know. We have a hypothesis though. We think that, you, okay, you need the integrin on the cell surface, but that's not enough for this muscle specific activity. There's something downstream it may have to do with signaling when the virus binds the integrin. It may have to do with trafficking of the capsid, but obviously something you have done to the capsid is influencing all of those things to make it muscle specific. All right. So I don't want you to think that it's just because it's binding alpha V beta six that it's targeting the muscle. It's more than that because that integrin is on other tissues as well. And they acknowledge that and they say, we, we need to figure out why it would be really interesting to do that. Iterative development of high potency vectors. I like that iterative, right? Because they yes. repeat it. All right. One more thing. While this paper was under peer review, another group in 2020 yeah. made muscle tropic variants. What they did was very cool. They actually 
took, uh, and we, we were writing the textbook when this came out, we incorporated it into, they identified ancestral AAVs from phylogenetic analyses, what must have existed before today. And they took some of those capsid sequences, built them into vectors and found one empirically that improved muscle delivery. That's what they, so they didn't do the kind of thing that was done here, but nevertheless, they have a whole paragraph devoted to saying, this is good what they did. It, it's, we support each other's findings. Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. like we were ignoring it. We're not going to tell you because we're <laughs> pissed that they did it, but we're going to, we acknowledge that two people have done this. That's important to move the field forward. And that's what we need more of. We need that kind of transparency and not absolutely saying. Well, and it's, so and it's a good point because they, they arrived at a similar result. Right. So which right. tells you, you know, this actually did work. Yeah. Right. Right. There's a, there's a network of muscular dystrophy workers. I knew one of them uh, at Columbia uh -huh. and, um, they, they are very different people because this is an intractable disease. If you ever see a victim of muscular dystrophy, you'll understand why they're so devoted to this um, trying to make a difference, obviously. And uh, they are very sharing. They all get their grant money from the Muscular Dystrophy Foundation, which used to be run by Jerry Lewis, as everybody would recall. Yeah. Yes. I don't, I don't know if this grant was supported by that. Probably was a little bit, maybe most of it. But... Um, this this group meets once a year in Las Vegas in order to well maybe not all the time in Las Vegas but they certainly did meet there a lot and um, it's a very like I said it's a very sharing group so there are muscle cultures by the way which you can set up to start off with myoblasts and end up with myotubes and mm -hmm. uh, you can study the evolution of striatoskeletal muscle this way because that's what I used to work on. Uh, in terms of the parasite that I was interested in. So a lot of this sounds familiar to me, <laughs> although in the distant past, uh, the Integrin story, of course, is there. But uh, this is uh, amazing. And they still haven't worked out a way of getting this message to every diseased muscle cell so that you can mm -hmm. convert a person with muscular dystrophy to a normal person. And, and Rianne, I think that's why they don't go for the injection into muscle because right. you're going to just affect that part of the muscle, but you're not going to affect the rest of the body. So I mean, you um, got, the problem is that you have, as an adult, you have all your muscles developed, right? You're not like, it's not like your immune system, which is continually regenerated from stem cells, right? Right. So if you introduce these genes into muscle stem cells, it wouldn't help all that much, right? Right. Yeah. Well, you try to identify a muscle stem cell and it turns out to be a myo blast mm -hmm. and then there's the satellite cells that they talk about in these little indented pockets along the striated cell muscle tissue which uh, supposedly takes over when a muscle cell gets damaged uh, the evolution of a new muscle cell starts with these satellite cells and yeah. uh, kind of a mystery as to what they actually do after they start to move towards a muscle soul. Dixon, you, you mentioned Jerry Lewis. Is he one of your favorite uh, comedians? No, actually. In his very, very early uh, <laughs> days, yes. But uh, no, he's not on my list. I'm sorry to say. He was uh -huh. He was not big in this country. He was big in France. He's big in France. That's right. Really? No, no one in this country has figured that out. By the and way. If, you've, <laughs> if you've ever seen French uh, clowning comedy, you'll yeah, yeah, understand yeah, yeah, yeah. why that's, it's that's very... Right. That's right. It's very much the same kind of silly. He, he you, was very mime-like, very mime-like. And, yeah. and I think that's a French very genre comedian. that, uh, that Alan, he resonated you, very well with. Did you ever watch Mr. Hugh Lowe, any of those? Oh, no. yeah, a lot of, lots, lots those of those. Those are the clowning. Yeah. It's it's old. It's quite old. Okay. And, yeah, the but one he's I remember, fantastic. Mr. Jacques Hugh Tati. Lowe. Jacques Tati is his no, name. It's, it's silent, right? He, he doesn't talk. He's just all miming. And it's, that's correct. That is exactly right. So, I mean, he's always making fun of modern world. Always, uh, yeah. you know. By the way, you, you guys were talking about tissue systems, and they say here um, you, we could use human muscle xenografts in mice, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Right. Oh. right. Okay. Take a new yep. mouse and there you go. put there human you muscle go. in, and there it will grow, and then you can make That's sense. Right. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. Anyway, I, I really like this because it's amazing science. And oh yeah, right. But also that this was going on during COVID. I really like that some people really kept focus yep. on other things, right? That's also, good. I know that the Sabeti lab also did a lot of COVID sequencing and stuff, but 
mm. really good because there are a lot of other important issues out there, right? And by the way, in the acknowledgments, they talk about their funding sources. And one of the people on this proposal, PCS, mm. got mm. a Shark Tank Award from the Broad Institute. Can you imagine uh, they have some kind of internal funding where they must have a competition, oh, right? Interesting. <laughs> I kind of don't like it because you know why, right? Yeah. But it's an interesting idea that you said, okay, we're going to have this competition for this one grant that we have and uh, you guys pitch it to us. Well, right? it's kind of a directed evolution grant proposal process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Cool stuff, folks. You bet. Let's do some picks. Right. Dixon, you're up. I know. Um <laughs> <laughs> My pick is this this week uh, comedian is uh, Sid Caesar. <laughs> and uh, he was actually my father's favorite comedian. Uh, it was a tie between he and uh, Red Skelton. And so I picked this bit that he did with uh, Howard Morris uh, called The German General. And you can't not watch it all the way to the end and understand what it's about because – uh, Sid Caesar was a, a fantastic um, imitator of foreign languages without saying anything. And yes. he would, every now and then he would throw in an English cognate so that you could follow along with what he was saying. And his attitude was, of course, uh, attendant with the words that he was using. And you'll see this bit. It's just an absolutely stunning, flawless, remember this is live television. And uh, from in front of a live audience, and they didn't blow one single opportunity to absolutely make you laugh like crazy. They did, uh, though, somehow patch in the end of this uh, bit with um, an outdoor scene, which you'll see uh, as you, you you look through this. But it's it, it's one of the all time classic uh, comic routines. So I, I thought you'd enjoy it. I wouldn't have picked uh, Sid Caesar. Uh, you liking it, Dixon? I love Sid Caesar. You I do? Love, I love him. Yeah, he was great. He was. He was. He used to be a comedy writer for. Um, oh, let me think. Uh, he was part of a big team. Uh, you know, Woody Allen was part of that team, and uh, mm -hmm. Mel Brooks was part of that team, and there were a lot of a lot of people that rose to the level of uh, stand up comic from the the joke writers that, uh, that helped the other stand-up comics, uh, make their fortunes. What number now is this on your list? Number three? That's number three. Okay. I'm going to ask you, but you don't have to answer. <laughs> Do you like Woody Allen? I did. I, I liked his early work until he was, uh, implicated in a situation which, uh, has some elements of truth to it so that you don't know really how far along the, um, the path to pederasty, I guess, is the word I'm trying to use here. Um, he's been accused of a sort of entrapment of a very young um, uh, adoptee, mm -hmm. which he yeah, later on married. Right. He yeah, later right. on married yeah. her. Yeah. And uh, as soon as that started to emerge as to his yeah. – um, I, I, I just – it was just turned off. I'm sorry it was. But his early work, like Sleeper, yeah, uh, was absolute and bananas. That they were just he's, absolutely he's funny. one of my uh, problematic favorites. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The I'm term with that you, people Alan. apply I'm, to this now where yeah, oh gosh, I'm really into it, really and then you discover some yeah, horrible yeah, yeah. thing about them and you say, Oh wow, that's right. We even that's right. Be that's right. Watching those films anymore. Right? Someone yeah. Dixon, because you're doing this, someone asked me the other night. My top three favorite comedians. I couldn't even name three. But I, <laughs> uh, well, you will after this. And <laughs> I've I got seven like, more to go. <laughs> so I like I like Robin Williams and George Car Carlin. Yeah, those two. They're stick great. They're me. great people. They were they were wonderful um, people. But I couldn't name a third. Can you believe it? That's so pathetic. I guess. Right. Oh, well. well, Rodney Dangerfield. Bill Cosby sure used to be way up on my list. Talking. Oh, about yeah. Yeah. There's another problematic phase. comedian. It's, That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. You know, I have still his vinyl, his early vinyl albums. I don't know Save how many them. times I listened to those when I, I listened to them worth, over and over. Worth funny. Funny. I yeah. really like them. I started out as a child. I was so good. Yeah, it's too bad. It's really too bad. But he was really well, talented, right? You know, Maybe. there's some parallels between comedians and scientists, and uh, certainly James sure. Watson fits into that yeah. category. Yeah. Uh, a fallen hero who, uh, you know, had a 
a weak spot in his personality that eventually was his downfall. And well, we know a lot of those people now because of the Me Too movement. Well, didn't you say last time, Dixon, to do comedy, you have to have issues, really? You do. You yes. really, I think you really do. But um, uh, since Caesar, I don't think he had too many personal issues. He just had a wonderful gift for um, observing people's funny bone. He could just appeal to their funny bone by just doing these uh, almost slapstick type things. But uh, hmm. this, this is, this is the top of his uh, game right here. That's the best he's ever done. I right. think in my view. Thank you. It's very interesting. I don't really like comedy, but I like hearing <laughs> people talk about it and what makes it good or bad. Oh, I think cool. you'll like this one. Brian, what do you have for us? Um, so I have an article that, I was really shocked by when I read it. I actually sat around and sort of said, why did no one tell me about this yeah. for quite a while? Um, so this is uh, something from the Atlantic um, about some sea slugs. And these sea slugs, of course, are animals. Um, and they um, eat algae and steal the uh, chloroplast and do photosynthesis. <laughs> um, so basically they are able to do short-term photosynthesis, even though they are an animal based on eating uh, some other uh, photosynthetic organism. And I just thought that was so cool. Uh, and it, in some point in the article, it mentions, what if you could eat a salad and then have the salad feed you for a week? <laughs> so, so they actually stick their chloroplasts into their own cells? Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they steal the uh, photosynthetic machinery from the algae that they eat. That's cool. Um, and, and then we'll go for um, it's months to like a year on the wow. photosynthesis from those stolen. Well, so that was my next class. question. Is there any, any uh, estimate of how much power they get out of the <laughs> photosynthesis relative to because they're probably still eating, right? Mm. Um, it set, so one of them um, apparently goes the rest of its life without eating. Wow! So I remember uh, uh, one day sitting outside having lunch in Florida with a planty friend of mine, Nassine's daughter, as a matter of fact. Um lamenting the fact that I had to work and thinking, you know, if I could just photosynthesize, right. Uh, there'd be no, there'd be no problem. And she said, yeah, but you wouldn't be able to move. Oh, you think huh? and I had so, never thought of it that way, but, but her, her idea was you can't get enough power out enough of photosynthesis to, 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 to locomote. No, that's not okay. true. You right. clean is like that. You but it's a, a this is a surface to volume problem. So these sea slugs are flat yeah. and they're moving slowly. And I think that combination allows them enough surface area that they can have their chloroplasts. And I love this term, kleptoplasty. I know, kleptoplasty. Ah, yes. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> yes. So uh, Brienne, there's a website. A lot of websites, but uh, Aplesia is one of those uh, mm. sea slugs also. Mm -hmm. They're called uh, sea hares as well. Yeah. And uh, aficionados of uh, saltwater aquaria collect them because there are so many varieties. And there's a high-resolution photograph website that I have accessed occasionally just to look at. And I made a collection of them once. And you should go there sometime and see how beautiful these things really are. They're oh, quite, I, I will. Yeah, they're I, quite, like I said. quite wonderful animals in every respect. I just read this whole thing and basically yeah, yeah. wanted to know why no one told me before. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that I think Rich was making, if you're a, a large animal, multicellular animal, like mice, you, 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 they can't be supported by photosynthesis, basically. Right. No, no probably not. Yeah. No. It's still cool. It's very yeah, cool. You know what? Very Maybe cool. bats, if bats... You know, because they have oh, a large never get area of wing. Out of, no, they the have like solar panels. Flight. They can have solar panels. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's the same reason, Alan, you could never fly a plane with solar panels probably, right? Not just running on the solar panels, no. Yeah. We, we wouldn't get enough power. Well, That's not your cool. airplane, but they did some already. Well, right, but you you don't it went around the world a lot in fact, of didn't it? cargo that way. You... No, 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 no. Well, that's that's yeah. 
when the efficiency improves, wait till you see. <laughs> no, this is uh, Catherine Wu again. Who we, it is. You must have picked her a few weeks ago, right? I, I have picked her before. Um, she is great. Uh, she is colleagues with Ed Young, and yeah. I would say they are sort of, you know, rivaling each other at this point for my favorite uh, writer there. So apparently she was on Andy Slavitt this week. Uh, some people mentioned that the other night. I didn't see it, but they said it was good. She's, yeah, you know she's what, generally you, great. You know what Andy Slavitt is, right? Yes. He does a pod podcast, but he used to be in, I don't know, one of the administrators. Was he in Obama's administration, I think, right? I think so. I, I know I see that podcast come up on social media. He served as the acting administrator of Medicare from 2015 to 2017. Yeah and temporary advisor to the COVID response team. He's a, he's a um, supply chain guy, <laughs> right? But he has a podcast now. He decided that, um, and he's very popular, um, but uh, he's, he's not a scientist, but he can ask some questions. Rich Condit, what do you have for us? I don't, th <clears throat> I don't think I've picked this before, but if I have, I don't remember, so nobody else will either. So I'll pick it again. <laughs> it's an an app available for both Android phones and uh, iPhones called iSeek, or called Seek, Seek. by a, an outfit named uh, iNaturalist. Okay. And um, it's just, uh, it's for identifying whatever life form out there there is that you run across. So I use it mostly for plants and I got it because, you know, you're walking around, you see a plant or a tree or something. You say, I wonder what that is. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Or <clears throat> not, you know, obviously it's a tree, but what name did humans give it? Yes. Okay? <laughs> and how is it related to other creatures? Okay. So you can, uh, you know, focus your can uh, boot this app, focus your camera on it. And, uh, you know, with any luck, it doesn't work all the time, but with any luck, It'll uh, identify it for you. And then, yeah. you know, there are other features that I don't use where you can, you know, become part of a group and uh, network with it and sort of uh, crowdsource identification and biodistribution and all the rest of it. Uh, but I really like it because, um, you know, it, uh, it helps me with those things. I pointed it at my granddaughter one time, told me she was a human. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was good. You pointed at your cat? I oh, yeah, tried got, that yet. I'll oh yeah, it'll, it'll get your. I've got I've got uh, our previous cat. When I when I picked this, this was one of my picks of the week a couple of years ago. I think. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, the the app has has developed further since then. But I, I think I might have uh, mentioned. I think of it as Pokemon Go for everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Makes it's a uh, you, you and, and with plants, the key is usually that it needs to see flowers or it needs to see. Uh, obviously, if you go around in winter in Western Massachusetts and you point it at a tree, it'll give you that it's a tree. Um, but if <laughs> if you get it in the springtime, you might actually get down the species. I think when you picked it, it was just plants, Alan, right? Oh, no, it it did everything at the time, but I had only done plants with it because okay. it's really hard. Uh, I'd love to be able to get some insect images, but they move around really yeah, fast. Yeah, plants hold still. Yeah. Yeah, plants hold still for you. As I've we've gotten, already discussed. I've got, <laughs> yes. yeah, I've got, I've gotten a couple of, um, of animals with it. I think uh, my daughter got an owl with it, um, which is pretty impressive. I've gotten a couple of birds too at the feeder. I have to get this. I'm going to download it right now. It's a great app. Very, uh, very. You know, there's one of these for for stars and yes, yeah. mm -hmm. I really like that. You just you can be inside. You just point what it. What star up. is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> middle you know of the about day. The one for you know about the one for commercial airlines. Oh, oh I pointed, pointed at an airplane yeah. in Flight the sky aware. and yeah, and oh, get really? the uh, route where it's coming from and uh, yeah, exactly. I think Flight I that's aware cool. Has that. Rich gave you, Rich told me about the one where you could put in a flight number and track it, right? Yeah, right. that's uh, uh, that too. Flight Radar 24. Ah, right. Seek by I iNaturalist. Here we go. Yeah, the go. flight radar is, uh, radar is very cool. I remember when we were at the giant virus meeting, Rich, uh, I, I departed first and uh, you, you sent me a picture where my airplane was, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Uh, here it is. You don't think Big Brother is watching? <laughs> <laughs> They're pointing the cameras at all of us. <laughs> all right, I'm downloading it so that I can um, 
Well, and, you know, my walk to the train station from here, there are no plants. Zero. Right. Hmm. There's just humans and. Well, it's you're right next to Penn Station. Structures, yeah. Yeah. yeah Skyscraper National choose. Park. Skyscraper, yes. yes. That's right. That's right. But once I get off the train, there'll be plants. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I love this kind of thing. Thank you. Very good. Um, <clears throat> oh, that makes Alan. You're, you're next. Here, here I am. Yes. Um, so my pick is an article I read a little while ago um, on a site called IGN, uh, which is a tech site. And it's a, a deep dive into what's so darn hard about making video games. And it's really interesting because it actually reminded me a lot of stuff that comes up on this show from time to time, or just in conversations with non-scientists where people will say, well, why can't you just, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, why, why can't they just make a vaccine that prevents the virus from getting into you, you know, and okay, I can answer that question, but first I need to give you a 20 minute lecture on how vaccines work. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there's stuff in video games where players will say, oh gosh, they totally screwed this up. Why didn't they just, and the answer is because that's really, really hard in, in almost every case, like things like the character in a game walking through a door or standing on a moving platform or things that look really simple on the screen turn out to be devilishly hard to program. And I, I, just was a fascinating article about the technology that goes into games. <laughs> well, you know, games have two parts. They have the programming and then they have the visual parts, right? Yeah. And it, sometimes the programmer d doesn't do well with the visual. So there are two people that have to be involved. They're right? separate people or on yeah. a, a big AAA game, it's dozens or hundreds of people working on the game and they all have to coordinate their efforts. And then it all has to work seamlessly together and, you see why these things take years to make. Yep. But if you get a good one, you can make a lot of money, right? You can make cool. a lot of money. Yes, that's the allure of it. Cool. Um, my pick is an article that was brought to my attention yesterday by Michael Schmidt on TWIM. So Michael talked about a cell paper where they there's a, there's a species of bacteria called Shiwanella. I'd never heard of it. Apparently, it's really good for making electricity. You can make anodes and cathodes, and they optimize, they optimize the system. So they just had to add a little silver, and apparently it makes more electricity than any bacterium has ever made before. And it's probably scalable and uh, will probably end up being used to make batteries at some point. Can you imagine? Cool. If it's the one, if it's the member of that genus that I am familiar with, it was... Uh, Cultured from a lake in upstate New York. Is that right? There, there is one uh, Shuanella <laughs> onidiensis um, that's from Oneida Lake. <laughs> Neat. I don't remember. Anyway, then Michael said that th this this article uh, he cited as an example of the potential use. Anyway, this is in Columbia News. It came out just a little while ago for um, Climate Week. The article is Columbia pledges that all future campus construction will be fossil free. So no more limestone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, energy generation. Energy. Fossil, <laughs> and fossil fuel free. Okay. Fossil fuel energy free. Energy generation. That's right. Yeah. And there goes the geology department. <laughs> <laughs> and the biology museum. Right. Dixon, were you, aware? Fossils in there. Were you aware of this uh, initiative? I was not, but I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm absolutely really thrilled. really cool. So they're going to try to figure out how to fully electrify the whole campus, replace combustion of fossil fuels with renewable uh, energy sources. And they have goals, right? They want to be a certain percentage by a certain time. And this is cool, right? It's all possible. All of it is possible. Um, so no, they're not going to buy electricity from Con Ed, right, Dixon? Well, that's what they don't want to do. That's true. So this is new process that uh, it's discovered by both groups at uh, uh, Michigan State University and MIT. It's a solution of um, chemicals that obviously they, they, they don't want to release what's in it yet because maybe they'll form companies based on it. But you can take a piece of glass window 
and paint this material on it and let it dry, and the window is still clear. Mm -hmm. But now the window functions as a photovoltaic so that you can actually replace all your windows with photovoltaic windows, which allows the visible spectrum to come through, but the infrared and the ultraviolet are captured by this material, shunted to the edges of the window and picked up by electrodes. And so you've converted mm -hmm. photons to electrons to electricity. Imagine how many um, cubic meters of glass there are in New York City. Just look at all the buildings and you can figure out how much energy potential there is sure. just in that. And there's tons of other things. So I think that's – once these technologies became um, semi-practical, I think you can make a statement like that. I, I, I really do believe that um, – Every, everybody will want to go off the fossil fuel grid eventually because it'll just be cheaper. I thought that's you would that's like the idea. I thought you would like this, Dixon. I'm I just not going to live long enough, you know? I'm going to try. Because we're, 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 <laughs> headed towards, we're headed towards a Gene Roddenberry universe, you oh, know? Well, These problems are solvable. He didn't live right? long enough. No, he didn't live he long enough. He did not live That's right. He did not. Hey, Rich, you got another 30 years. I hope. Yeah, you told me the other day you're going to live to 100. Well, yeah. There you go. But, um, I, I want to live to 100 as long as I know who I am. <laughs> yeah. So this, remember, this is just new campus construction. You know, I got it. But they're going to convert a lot of this stuff, say, too. They say it'll apply to renovations, too. That's what I see right here. Okay. So... Because so I was going to say, the cynical in us would say they have no new planned construction for the next 20 years. It was the, it was the very first thing that came to my mind. Actually, the second thing after I thought, oh, so no limestone. Um, I'll tell you something. The, the second thing that came into my head was it's Columbia. So it must be because they fully built out their campus and they're not building anymore. Yeah. Right. But, the, but they actually, they're going to apply this, um, they claim, to um, to renovations as well. And, exactly, exactly. And repairs. But also um, the main, the Morningside campus is built out, but. It is. Uh, the the um, one in between Manhattanville, which is between the two campuses, that's not yep. fully built out. And right. this, this would apply to that. No, and look at all the buildings on Manhattanville that have just solid glass windows on all sides. Yeah. Those would be perfect candidates for this kind of an approach. But um, this is great. I mean, I yeah. think it's really fantastic. The Manhattanville campus, I've been in one building there. It's mm -hmm. the whole wall is glass. Yes. Right? Yes. It's just a sheet of glass on the outside with their exactly. paint. But there's, you know, not like Hammer where the glass only goes halfway down and then it's something else. <laughs> You can't right. see through. And it's completely soundproof. There's an elevated subway that goes right in front of oh, the building. Important. You can't that's hear it. I was so at a loud. meeting and I'm looking at these trains go by. And I can't even, the, the meeting was boring. <laughs> the trains that go by, I couldn't hear them. It's amazing. So to come back to the other campus, though, the, the building that really needs to be replaced with a new building that does all of this is the Department of Architecture. Uh, that's one of the oldest buildings on campus, and yet all of the modern architects, uh, you know, flock to this mm. this department because they learn so much. But the building itself is impossible to navigate. It's absolutely is it horrible. not a very interesting building? Correct, all of the above. Because you don't want to take down Low Library or Butler Library. No, 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 no. Right. Very no those pretty. are iconic buildings. Those are yeah. iconic buildings. But but the buildings that really should be functioning, they should be preaching what they preach. And uh, the building itself does not preach what they preach. In Hamilton Hall. I used to teach my yeah. virology course in yeah. Hamilton. There's right. a statue of Alexander Hamilton out front. Exactly. And I used to always look at it and just think I mean, of it, musicals. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful old uh, world architectural yeah. style campus, but it needs it needs this. The shopping yeah, I mean, arm will be up. Not all of the buildings are... Very interesting, but yeah. No, you're it's right. good. But anyway, this is very cool. I'm very proud yeah. of them, although it's going to be hard to do. It's a great pick. It's a great pick, Vincent. Uh, we have a couple of uh, listener picks, one from Gary. Dear Twiv, after hearing yesterday's discussion on Q&A as to who is the best science communicator, I came across another insightful piece in The Atlantic by Ed Young, who should surely be considered among them. Um, we're already barreling toward the next pandemic. I have a feeling someone's picked this already, right? Did someone, one of you guys? Uh, I think that one actually just came out, but he has okay. a couple that have similar titles. 
Yeah, we had a discussion on this live stream the other night, and Ed's name came up, and lots, lots of other people's names. Uh, Eve, Alan Dove, you were amongst them. They think you're a great science community. Oh, wow. <laughs> cool. So, Gary, thank you for that. And Bruce writes, I really love this podcast. I started listening at the beginning of the pandemic and am now hooked. You helped keep me sane. I watched this Nova special on bats and thought of you. It has some of the subjects you've covered in previous episode. It really changed the way I look at bats. Thought I would submit it as a listener pick. Thanks for all you do. Keep up the good work. Bruce is from Isla, who had us Mexico. Oh, interesting. Uh, have you watched this, Dixon? Yes, I did. Attentively. I haven't seen it. It was fantastic. In fact, I knew a guy at Rockefeller who studied bat uh, communication. His name was uh, Griffin, as a matter of fact, and he worked up at the uh, uh, the zoo, the, the Bronx Zoo as well. And uh, there's a wonderful exhibit up there called World of Darkness. If you haven't seen it, you should go because they've got a lot of bats in it. <clears throat> yeah. In case you want to know what a bat looks like. <laughs> I, I know what bats look like, but they're alive, I presume, right? Yes, they're alive. The other place to go see a lot of bats is Yankee Stadium, but that's another subject. <laughs> you know, the, the, um, I mean, you Sorry, can go to the Museum that. of Natural History and they're all stuffed, right? That's true. That is absolutely right. Um, I remember visiting the, the London Zoo. They have a nocturnal exhibit. It's just... Yes. Yep. Amazing. All these yep. animals that come out at night and they, the room is all dark, of course, but they're all That's hot. what the, the yeah, Bronx no, that's is. World, world of Darkness, of darkness is, like is the same, same way. You should see yeah. it. Yeah, it's really good. They have, really they have light, a very, very dim lighting in the animal yes, cages, right. so you yeah, can see the animals. Are the bats flying around? They are. Yeah, absolutely. But they're behind the glass, though, I presume, right? They are behind yes. the glass, but they feed them by putting fish in the water, mm. and you can actually watch them... Call them out and take them oh, back. I to wanna, I'd like to go see that. So what? Yeah, it's nice. Bronx Zoo is open, Dixon. I, I presume it is. Yes, it is. And what? Do you, I presume you need to wear a mask, right? I haven't been recently, so I can't say. But I, if you don't, of course, then <laughs> there's something wrong with this picture. <laughs> I would anyway. But uh, yeah, that sounds like a fascinating exhibit. All right, that is Twiv eight one two microbe.tv slash Twiv for the show notes. Questions and comments, Twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. I need to get better, faster internet here. Actually, I don't think it's the internet today because this Zoom is fine, right? Must be something. Yeah. Anyway, microbe.tv slash contribute. We'd love your support. Dixon de Palmier can be found at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thanks, Dixon. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. This was um very educational. You'll notice I didn't have much to say throughout most of that uh, presentation. <laughs> All right. Not, not a worry. Elio Schechter, Elio Schechter joined us yesterday. He hasn't, he's been out for a while. He's been ill and uh, he didn't say a word, but we could tell that he was enjoying it. Right. Okay. Brian Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm now going to go home and watch TV about baths. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove, alandove.com, Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>